Excellency and Brother Bishops, all my amazing and wonderful priest brothers, deacons and servers, and all the people of God. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for the support that you unflinchingly and unflinchingly gave Father Joe throughout his priesthood and throughout his illness. If you didn't get a chance to hear the homily that Father Paul Scalia preached last month at the funeral for his father, Justice Antonin Scalia, you would do well to go online and read it. After the opening recognitions of the various leaders of the church present, he said the following. We are gathered here because of one man, a man known personally to many of us, known by reputation to even more, a man loved by many, scorned by others, a man known for great controversy and for great compassion. That man, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth. My brother wasn't a Supreme Court justice, nor a cause for great controversy, nor was he scorned, at least not by those who knew him. But his life, his mission, his work, and even his death were all about Jesus of Nazareth. And that is why we are gathered here today. For it was Jesus of Nazareth who came to a world fallen in sin, broken in spirit, and ravaged by sickness and death, in order that he should offer the perfect sacrifice necessary to fulfill the covenant, and to restore the relationship of prodigal humanity with the just and merciful Father. To extend the invitation of participation in redemption and sanctification to all humanity in every time and place, and to make effective the initiation of those who will receive his grace and be so healed and transformed, he established the sacraments, the physical signs capable of dispensing and infusing into our souls, into our lives, a share in the life of God himself, or as we call it, grace. And so we have baptism that births the life of God within us. And then we have confirmation that seals the power of the Spirit within our life, directing and guiding it to a particular purpose or end. Next comes the Eucharist, which feeds and sustains and empowers that life to grow stronger and more charitable toward God and others. After these sacraments of initiation, we are given the sacraments of reconciliation and the anointing of the sick to heal and restore our souls and bodies in relation to God when we struggle to maintain the health of our walk in Christ. But such tremendous gifts that are instruments of God to impart and elevate a life in union with his spirit are not to be left unprotected, non-applied, or devalued. Thus Christ established a further sacrament, another instrument, that of the priesthood, of the very person of the priest himself through whom he would act to confect, transmit, and restore grace in the hearts and souls of humanity. Or, as St. Paul puts it, now all these things, all these sacraments, are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so what is a priest? He's a man 
but called to participate in God's grace and by God's mercy to become what the early church termed an altar Christus, another Christ. He is to be a man of prayer and a man of sacrifice, giving his life day in and day out for the sake of his people, particularly for their sanctification and salvation assisting in bathing the people of God in the waters of the life of the Spirit, presenting to Christ a spotless bride in the heavenly wedding feast. In fact, as the stand-in for Christ, the priest is married, but not to a particular woman here on earth. Rather, he is married to the church. Again, you hear St. Paul in Ephesians when he says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Thus we are all called as Christians to take up our cross and follow him if we would be worthy of the name Christian. For it is only through submission, union, and obedience to the will of God that we will be made holy in His grace. And such union can only be tested and perfected through suffering. Jesus demonstrated this in His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. We prayed over and over, let this cup of suffering pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. St. Paul says it was through suffering that Christ was perfected and became our exemplary leader. Hence the priest is called to be preeminent in doing so as well. As an exemplary witness of uniting with the sufferings of Christ in perfect conformity and obedience to the will of God, even should it call for a true and complete gift of self in dying for his people. In this, in truth, Father Joe almost never had a chance. While Jesus was born to Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem, a town which means house of bread, Father Joe was born to Joseph and Mary in Corpus Christi, Texas, <laughs> a name which means the body of Christ or rather the Eucharistic bread we receive in communion at every Mass. And while his journey to the priesthood was a challenging and circuitous one, at every step it brought him face to face with the cross and taught him the virtues and strength of character to face that cross unflinchingly and perseveringly. Father Joe was no stranger to suffering but was willing to patiently endure it and often defeated it. Thus, it was as if he were born and ordained to suffer. Just before his ordination, the Boston Globe wrote the story on the sexual scandals in the priesthood and the character, nature, and dignity of the priesthood was under attack daily in society. It was at that same time that Father Joe, preparing to return to the Navy as a chaplain, found he could not complete his daily running regimen and was diagnosed with leukemia. Immediately, at the very onset, with that backdrop of the scandals, he offered his sufferings as a prayer for the priests of Atlanta and said so much himself. It was almost as if he knew he would not be able to serve fully in the active priestly ministry, and so he committed himself to being a priest's priest. From that day forward, the suffering began. Bone marrow transplants, while mostly life-saving, are never easy affairs. And when his new marrow began producing an entirely new immune system, this body guardian began to attack every major organ in his body one at a time. Alternately, his eyes, 
then his lungs, then his intestines took turns being assaulted, and then it was his skin's turn. In 2005, his skin began to thin out and bubble up, eventually splitting open and forming multiple wounds across his back that were often unseen because of his clothing. Many attempts were made to heal them, gauze laced with silver, unique and creative skin grafts and other medical wonders. None ever really worked well for long, and the immune system continued its unmerciful attack. But throughout, heedless of the pain that he had endured and continued to endure, he never once complained or rescinded his commitment to pray and suffer on behalf of our priests. And this suffering then gave him a power unknown to those who shirk or run from the cross. More powerful than any sermon, more poignant than any spiritual direction, more convicting than any examination of conscience, Father Joe's sufferings and wounds and patient endurance spoke to us all and challenged us to reflect on our own understanding of the power of suffering and of our own weakness and inability to endure it in our own lives or in the lives of others. St. Paul knew the power and witness of suffering well. When he said, I make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, he was acknowledging that Christ's sufferings were wholly necessary and powerful, that our sufferings, endured as Christ did, have the power to make visible once again his sufferings, so that the uninitiated modern man might be more aware of the profound mystery of the love of God on our behalf. And finally, that our sufferings draw us more deeply into union with his heart, giving us more wisdom, mercy, understanding, and more love. This was the trifold mystery that Father Joe discovered. As many of you witnessed in his ministry, when he was well and when he was sick, online, or in his presence, on stage, or on the altar. If I could sum up what many of you have shared in your reflections on the impact of knowing Father Joe, it would be this. He was another Christ, an altar Christus. He was not perfect, however. And this he wanted to make sure that we would know and remember, asking us all to pray for him after he was gone. I remember one night in particular as I nursed him and watched him wince and squirm in discomfort from his wounds. I stopped and asked for his forgiveness for the wounds that he endured as prayer for my sins and imperfections as a priest of the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And he looked up at me and said, hey, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese as well. <laughs> I oftentimes believe that God sends us exactly what we need if we're paying attention. Father Joe won't make national or international news. He wasn't a catchy story of violence or scandal or sin. But in the face of the priest scandal, God sent us a priest's priest, a true man of God and an altar Christus to respond to the attack on the priesthood in general with a remarkable priest in person. His selfless and unwavering faith, hope, and love, even in the face of unrelenting and excruciating suffering, stand in stark contrast to the image so many in the world would have us believe is the stereotypical priest. In the end, he was everything a priest should be, a stand-in for Christ, a sacramental continuation of his sacrificial presence 
here on earth. I'm proud to call him my brother. But I'm even more awed and humbled to call him my fellow priest. As an Army National Guard chaplain, I am responsible for mentoring four other chaplains, none of whom are Catholic, but all of whom are Christian. When one of them heard of Father Joe's death, he texted me. So sorry to hear. Did he know Christ? <laughs> yeah. I think so. Up close and personal. God be with you, my brother. Pray for us, your brother priests, and loving people as we pray for you. Let us do all for the greater honor and glory of God.